Hi, everyone. If you're like me, you have found mobile phones in the classroom to be both a blessing and a curse. There are times when I want my students to have access to the outside world, but there are other times when I just want my students fully engaged in the classroom without distracting technology. This is where our sponsor Flipped comes in. Flipped is a first ever classroom engagement application that keeps students from getting distracted by their mobile phones when they're learning, and it does it in a really clever way. Some instructors have even reported that Flipped has been associated with increased grades and reduction in attrition. If you are interested in learning more about Flipped, please visit flippedapp.co backslash psych. That's F-L-I-P-D A-P-P dot C-O backslash psych. Hello and welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Garth Newfeld, along with Eric Landrum, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the in stuff. This is episode number 68, where Eric had the opportunity to interview Chris Green from York University in Toronto, Ontario. But before we get to that, Eric and I want to express our thanks to the Association for Psychological Science for providing some space for psych sessions to record this podcast. And we want to invite you to contribute to an upcoming feature on Psych Sessions called Ask Psych Sessions. This is your chance to ask a question about the teaching of psychology. That could be a big picture question or a nuts and bolts question. And Eric and I will get someone to answer it. And we'll post the questions and answers as Ask Psych Sessions bonus episodes, probably on Sunday night starting soon. Just go to bit.ly backslash ask psych sessions to post your questions. That's bit.ly backslash all lowercase ask psych sessions with no spaces. And if you have not yet had a chance to go onto iTunes and rate the Psych Sessions podcast, we invite you to go there. Uh, It helps us pop as people are searching on iTunes, and it will help Psych Sessions get out to more teachers of psychology. Now, before you hear this interview with Chris Green, please allow me to share some listening tips and some of my favorite moments of this interview. Well, this interview is very interesting for me because had I interviewed Chris Green, I don't think it would have gone where these guys went in the interview. And I say that with uh, tons of admiration uh, for Eric and for Chris. These are two uh, folks who have been at this teaching thing for a long time. And Eric talks about 15 to 20 years ago, coming across something that Chris did, which always stuck with Eric. It was a very generous act uh, towards teachers of psychology, and they are going to tell that story right off the bat. When I think about this, and I I don't want to give it away, but I will just say that Chris saw a problem, and he addressed it in a new way, in a way that nobody else was doing— And then he didn't just keep it to himself and his students. He made it available for everybody. And I think what Eric Eric calls it like OER before OER existed. Remember, this is 15, 20 years ago. Although Chris brings so much and has brought so much to uh, teaching of psychology, I would say that after listening to this entire interview, one of his greatest contributions has to be innovation. And uh, maybe this is what uh, some of us just do best. You know, not all of us are researchers, although he is. uh, But some of us have to find new ways of doing old things, uh, more contextual ways, uh, ways that give greater access to more people. And so, Chris, thank you for leading uh, in those ways, and hopefully many of us will take a page out of your book and uh, and will also find better ways of disseminating psychology, not only to the public, but also to our colleagues who may not have access to it. As I know that I've talked to some of our high school teaching colleagues who uh, don't have all the access to the journals um, that we have at in higher ed at colleges and universities. So I really appreciated that. I think that Chris is uh, generous, as Eric highlighted, but I also think that Chris is innovative, and that was really fun to hear about. I must say 
that this is quite honestly the first time I ever thought to myself, history of psychology is really fascinating. Chris Green loves the history of psychology, like so many of our friends in STP. And I hope that nobody hears me putting down the history of psych, because I know some of you love it dearly. It's just never captured me. And even those folks who do love uh, teaching uh, history of psychology, they will tell you that it's hard to pull off. It's hard to get students really engaged in the material. And Chris says as much. But the way he talks about it, I was kind of on the edge of my seat. And Eric, probably, I don't know, 30 seconds after I was kind of feeling this way, recognizes that in the interview and asks Chris about what it would be like to be in his class. Um, I, or maybe he was actually trying to get into Chris's class. I'm not sure. But I really like the way that Chris talked about culture and context and it seems really obvious to me that he brings those things into his history of psych class. And, um, and that, makes, that makes all the difference for me personally. Then it doesn't read like a history book. It reads, uh, to me, this, uh, the way he's presenting this course is, uh, is much more tangible to me. And I, can, uh, I just find it more interesting to think about context. How did these research studies and these theories and These understandings, how did they buy into these things? How did they sell these things? Why was everybody doing these kinds of things? These are the questions that he gets into. One of my favorite takeaways from this episode is the way that Chris talks about different courses as being, and I think it was in the context of statistics, but different courses being like cookbooks. When you start teaching a course, it is like starting to prepare a meal And I'll probably go farther with this than he does. But somebody gives you the ingredients. They tell you how to do it. And uh, and then you try to replicate what uh, the best practice is for uh, cooking this particular meal. But as you do it more and more, you can start to get creative with that process. And this is where I think uh, Chris's innovation really comes in. Because he is of the opinion that you really need to know the book well. You need to know the recipes before you start to play around with them successfully. So is our job as teachers to first critique the discipline with our students? I think he would say no. The job of teachers of psychology is first to build a solid foundation and understanding of the discipline in order to critique it and make it better. And even as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, my goodness, there's innovation even in that. So this is a great episode. They cover lots of ground in this. And one final thought that they uh, reference and Eric talks about is when Chris Green posts on the site Teach Listserv, stop, don't skip over it, read it because it's usually pretty substantial and uh, really will benefit lots of teachers of psychology. So with that, enjoy the interview. We're here at APS in 2019. Thank you to APS for the room and for the space. I'm here with Chris Green from York University, Ontario, Canada? Yep, Toronto. Toronto, I'm sorry. Uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, if I get the uh, city and province correct. Yep. All right, finally. How about that? And so, Chris, thank you for taking time. I really do appreciate it. That's my pleasure. So I first learned about you from something incredibly generous that you did 15, 20 years ago, maybe? History of Psychology Classics. Oh, yeah. And uh, for anyone out there who doesn't know about this, this resource is still out there because I just used it a few years ago. I don't know what came over you, but you... (laughs) I'm glad you're smiling over that. But you went back and digitized some of the original works in psychology. Why don't don't you tell our listeners about that? Um, Yeah, yeah. well, it's a website that has a couple hundred uh, articles and books and book chapters um, from the past and a little bit of secondary material from more recent historians about that original material. And um, the reason I did it was um, actually mostly entirely selfish. Um, your listeners will not remember these days unless they're of a certain age. There used to be these grotty, horrible little um, 
um, print shops on every college campus in North America, and you would have to go there and get your reading list for your course printed up there, and then they would charge some outrageous amount of money to your students mm -hmm. to have this badly photocopied, Sherlock bound package of readings. And um, I, you know, nobody liked doing this, and... Um, I have a little bit of old computer skills, and a buddy of mine who has better computer skills literally came over to my apartment then one afternoon and taught me how to code in HTML, which is the language you use for right. websites. And I went, oh my gosh, I could put this all online and my students could download it, and I would never have to deal with one of those print shops again. And that's how it got started. Yeah, but the thing is, here's what's different about that. And you were you were 10 or 15 years ahead of everybody else. You could have done that and put that online for your students and made that available in your for your your department for your courses and been done with it. But you made it available for everybody. You figured out a website, and it's still available today. Yeah. And you know that that's OER before OER was cool. Yep. And so, yep. Well, well, I'll tell you what happened is I put up a few for my own courses, and I noticed that other people started using them. You know, there wasn't really an easy way to firewall it, and I had no reason to firewall it. Right. And so, um, people started using it, and so I thought, oh, this could be very useful. And especially at that time, in Eastern Europe, in South America, in Asia, it was pretty hard to come by Western journals because they were still, you know, right. printed objects that sat in libraries. If the library had bothered to buy them, there was nothing online. Um, none of the journals had their back catalogs online at that point. Some of them had begun to put their most current issues online and sort of back five or ten years. And most of these materials are from the 1890s, the 1900s, mm -hmm. the 1940s. 1950s. Oh, and there was a, an extra little bit, which is I found out through an accident that um, back in the days when you had to renew copyright after 28 years um, to get another 28 years, um, APA never did that. And so, whereas the what, what they call the drop dead date, the date for everything being um, in public domain is like uh, 1923, 1926, something like that, right. um, for APA journals, um, it's like 1962. And so I was uh, had access to all this stuff in the 40s and 50s and, and 30s and 20s. And well, and I remember I, I, I came across this, these materials when I was prepping for history of history and systems of site class. And I wanted to give them access to some original materials that um, I couldn't easily find. Um, and I had access to North American libraries and I had access to things. But I couldn't, I just couldn't find certain things. I couldn't find certain book chapters. I think I'm remembering that. And you had them, and you had them there, and they were links. I could download it, I could format it, I could put it in a packet. Uh, my students didn't have to pay for it because I could Xerox it, I could give it to them, I could put it in a syllabus. And so, and I just, I, I just remember that plain as day and having that. And no one, I don't remember anybody else doing that. And you were doing that. Early 90s? Is that? Um, I think that site came out about 1998 or 99. Okay, late 90s. I, I had done some uh, websites for some scholarly organizations in uh, okay. 1995, 96. So this was like three years after the World Wide Web had come into existence, actually. Which, so, which is the really early days of the World Wide Web. It was. I mean, I actually found some business cards the other day where I have a BitNet address. There you go. I don't have an internet address. It ends in bitnet.idbsu.idbsu. BSU. It doesn't yep. even end in .edu. Yep. So, um, and so I, 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 that's where I first met you, so to speak. That's where I first learned about you through your generosity. Well, thank you. You, doing that. you used it exactly the way I intended people to use it. I wanted people to have access to that. Okay. Without, you know, and, uh, I think getting primary source material into history of psychology courses is really important. A yeah. lot of people teach that course depending entirely on a textbook. <clears throat> and some of the textbooks are fine, but you are always sort of the victim of the interpretations of the textbook writer, and it's always nice to look at the original and see whether the students themselves agree with the interpretation that, right. the, that the textbook writers and, put on. And let them read it in the original text, in, right. in, in, the, you know, in, the, in the author's own words. That's right. So are you still teaching the History of Sight course? Um, I don't teach it at the undergraduate level very much anymore. Um, I teach it at the graduate level every year. So... So uh, the challenge is for me with undergraduates when I when I've taught the course as a capstone course, 
making it relevant. Yep. Uh, I'll bet you find a way to make it relevant. I'll, no? Okay. Well, I don't know. I, 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 so, think, I think students differ on that, right? <laughs> well, and, you know, and I, I know people around the country who, I, I, you know, Barney Bynes talks about this course and loves it. Ken Keith, Ludie Benjamin, I would love to sit in on Ludie Benjamin, his history of site course. Yeah. I was talking to Dave Kreiner earlier today at a podcast we recorded. He loves teaching the course. So there's lots of passion for the course. There's lots of really good textbooks about the course. Um, when I teach the course... I, I've taught a straight history and systems from start to stop, you know, hi, you know, Wundt in the you know history of psychology, even the prehistory, all the way through, you know, structuralism, functionalism, through mm-hmm. the isms. I have a hard time. I, I I personally love the history of psychology. I think it's fascinating. I I love the stories. I I love the controversies that happen within the characters. But I, but I have a hard my my students have a hard time connecting to it. Yeah, I understand. Um, I I think some people try and connect history to what's going on today, mm-hmm. and that can make it relevant for, for people. Um, but it also distorts the history because the people in the past had no idea what we're doing now, of course. Right. Um, and so it's a way of um, generating some energy, generating some interest. But for me, what I like to do is uh, ask the question, why? Did those people in the past, who are just as smart as we are and just as yeah. you know moral as we are, um, make these decisions that are so wildly alien sometimes to the way we would make decisions today? Um, that's the interesting question for me. It is. Why is phrenology a good thing when phrenology comes out, when we look at it and we go, that's crazy? Yeah. But hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of people were, were interested in phrenology at that time. Um, why, you know, today we think eugenics is horrific, but in the 19-teens and 1920s, America was enamored of eugenics. And it wasn't a right-wing movement as we think of it today. It was as much a left-wing movement as a right-wing movement. Yeah. Um, that's a really interesting question. So it is. trying to get yourself using the context, using the other stuff that's going on around the psychological theories and the psychological discoveries to figure out why those people viewed uh, these historical events so much differently from the way we do today is really the key for me. That's what I enjoy. I would love to, I think I would love to be in your history of psychology class. Cool, good. Yeah, so uh, do you ever teach it online? No, I've never taught it online. Never actually. online or a no. MOOC or something like that? So um, no. Massive I, openly online Yeah, course. No, I haven't done that. Um, there's something about being in the room with people and, oh. and, and seeing their reactions. Um, you know, when you're teaching, especially controversial topics, uh, if, you're, if you're putting it out to 100,000 people who you don't know, um, all kinds of strange things can happen. Ab- absolutely. Do you by any chance have a philosophy background as well as psychology? Yeah, yeah, I have have two PhDs, actually. I have a PhD in psychology. I was sort of computational cognitive science. And then I went back about a decade later and did a philosophy of science degree. Really? A philosophy of science? Yeah. So so tell me about that. First off, what, what, what drove you to go back? And then what drove you to go back for that? Right. Um, I mean, I... I had always had an interest in philosophy. Um, I've always taken philosophy courses sort of alongside my, my you know, the, the main psychology programs that I was in. Um, and by the time I graduated uh, with a psychology degree, I sort of thought of myself as a theoretical cognitive science. Mm-hmm. I was a inter- scientist. I was interested in the theoretical issues um, more than the, the technical issues. Um, and I found it very difficult to get attention at philosophy conferences and in philosophy journals. I didn't quite speak the right language. And um, so the only way you learn to speak the right language is to go and be trained. And I finally decided I just had to go back and get inculcated into the culture of philosophy. So, but you wanted it so bad, you went back to grad school. Yeah, well, I liked grad school. I, was, I thought it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not every single day was fun. No, but... but, but... That's that's impressive. I mean, you liked. I mean, you. It, it's not like uh, I, I really wanted to be accepted at these philosophy conferences, but you know, I just kind of gave it up. You wanted it bad enough that you went back to school. Yeah. So, so did you have your full time gig as a psychology professor, and you did? Did you do grad school part time? Um, well, I had a I had my first sabbatical actually, and I. Okay. I went. I went back to school the year before my sabbatical and did some coursework then mm-hmm. on the side, and then I sort of finished off my coursework while I was in my sabbatical, so I didn't have to teach that year. 
and then you know you went on dissertation and stuff like that. It, and did you do that at York? So you did you did that at the school that you teach at? No, I did it back at University of Toronto, um, where I had done my uh, my psych PhD ten years before. Okay, wow, that's dedicated. Okay, I, I'm sorry. So I don't I, I know you a little bit, but I don't know you know that well. But that just impresses the hell out of me. I'm not surprised by that. Most people think it's insane. But. I no, I, I, I I'm not I'm I don't think it's insane. I think it's impressive. And one of the things, Chris, that you know that I notice about you, whenever you post on the site teacher listserv, I always read it. Because you typically cut to the chase. You typically ask very insightful questions or you have very insightful answers to someone's query on that listserv. And so, so you think deeply about stuff. I, I try. Thanks. No, you, uh, you, you, well, from my perspective, you do. So uh, thank you, actually, really. And so I'm trying to wrap my head around, so how many other degrees do you have? Um, well, I have a master's degree and a bachelor's degree in psychology, and I was in music <laughs> before that, which did not result in actual degrees. Okay, but, but have you gone back for other degrees beyond psychology and, and philosophy? No, no. My, my wife, um, when I did the second PhD, made me um, promise that I would not go back for any further graduate degrees okay. unless they involved um, very lucrative professions like law or medicine. Okay, so. okay. all right. All right. I'm just trying to... Re- that That is fascinating that you, that you would go back. And I'm... I'm I, I know faculty members who have gone back and taken classes. Uh, a buddy of mine at Boise State is taking French. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he and his family went to France, and they loved it, and they want to keep going back. And so he's, I think he's in French 102 right now. And I don't know if he's going to be an undergraduate major in it, but I don't think he's going to do a dissertation. I don't think he's going to you know, do that. I'm, so I'm just... You got to give me a second. I'm a little thrown off by it. I got to, I got to wrap my head you know, In a way, it. in a way, I mean, I didn't hadn't done whole degrees before, but in a way, it wasn't that unusual for me. When I was in my first year of my PhD, I decided that I needed to learn a bunch of math that I had missed earlier in my academic career. So I spent a year doing like three calculus courses and a linear algebra course and stuff like that because it was just a body of information that I wanted to know so that I could be better at stats and methods and things like that. But did you really need the calculus to be better at stats and methods? Oh, man, calculus just turns your head around. Calculus makes the world look different. But, okay, so uh, every math professor I've ever talked to, when, when they're really super honest with me about calculus, they, they kind of admit that calculus has no real practical application. No practical application. Well, I, I was doing it for <laughs> academic reasons, and it has tons of academic applications. I mean, unless you're going to Home Depot and you want to figure out how much sod you need under the curve of your curvy lawn that goes to the straight part of your street, you know, the straight part of the other side of your lawn, and you want to calculate that exactly, and you don't want to, you know, cut the sod. Yeah. I mean... You'd never cut accurately enough doing it that way right. anyway. Ex- exactly. But you I, don't understand your statistics unless you don't do calculus. All those tables that are at the back of the book that used to be at the back of the book when yeah, we yeah, had yeah. like ta- all those tables are doing your calculus for you. All that finding the area under the normal curve, finding the area under a T curve, finding the area under an F curve, that's all calculus. That's all calculus it's based? All, it's all calculus. And all that the book is doing is your calculus for you. It's telling you what those areas are. If you had calculus, you'd just calculate it yourself. Really? Yeah. Okay. All right. I, you know what? You obviously know way more about this. I'm going to trust you on this one. Okay. I'm going to trust you on this one. So when you, so you, I think you told me that you teach a graduate level statistics now, or is it undergrad? Uh, both. I teach both. So at what level, if any, do so? So at York, is calculus a prerequisite for stats? No. It's not. Okay. So so how do you communicate? How do you then? So how do you teach stats then? Well, I taught the intro stats, the full year, you know, basic. Z's and T's and F's and chi squares course for okay. 20 years. Uh-huh. Um, and I got better at it. I started, you know, being a horrible, very young 
instructor expecting the wrong things from uh, my students. Okay. Um, and after 20 years, I got better. At least I think I got better. Um, and after that, finally after about 20 years, I thought, you know, I think I've done everything with this course that I can. And we were um, revising our curriculum and this intermediate uh, stats laboratory uh, became available. And so for the last three or four years, I've been teaching that. That's my, my main undergraduate stats course. And that's a course, you know, often that course is where they teach the kind of next level of statistics, multiple regression and things okay. like that. Um, but I don't use it that way. I actually use it to go back to what they were mostly mistaught in the first year, and I reteach it, and we take it apart, and we see how the pieces work together, and we talk a little bit about the stuff that's caused the replication crisis. We talk a little bit about p-hacking and these kinds so of that's, issues. So for you, that intermediate stats is the second class for undergraduates. That's right. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have one of those. It's our. It's a 400-level class. We call it advanced stats. I don't think it's really advanced stats, but that's what we call it. Right. And so uh, in your stats or research methods, you don't cover um, p-hacking or replication crisis at all? In the first year? Yeah, yeah. Um, well... Because we don't. When I, when I taught it, that yeah. stuff didn't have the kind of profile in the yeah. discipline that it does now. Yeah. Um, I would hint at certain problems, but yeah. you really have to kind of... Um, you have to learn the cookbook first, yes. and then you have to learn how to do your own recipes out yeah. of the cookbook, how to modify the recipes. Yeah. And so I, I, I taught it pretty cookbooky. Um, uh, for people who um, had the right ears, they could hear me hinting at various problems without going into them in too much detail. Um, but uh, now that I'm teaching this intermediate course, which is only taken by our honor students, actually, okay. um, I can go into a lot more detail with that. And Yeah, I, I you know, I just... I'm at this place for me in my career where, you know, at that at that uh, introductory stat level, it, it, and I guess it's also research methods, I'm not so sure, you know, if they can just get the basic concepts, I'm really happy with that. And to understand the replication crisis, you've got to understand the basic concepts, and then you've got to understand the flaws in the process and where we fail and that's important to understand, but I'm not so sure it's in the first level courses, at least not for my students. Yeah, it's, I don't, I, it it's not. I mean, I think with honor students, maybe you could do that. But um, and I, I've had conversations with other instructors. How can you not teach that? Well, I, I'm pretty comfortable not teaching that. You, yeah, I think you have to teach it straight the first time. You, yeah, there are. I mean, you run into this problem yeah. in a bunch of other courses too. I have one guy in my department who teaches this very um, sort of critical. Uh, course in introductory psychology. I think the material is fantastic material, but I w often wonder what do these students who don't know anything about psychology to begin with, or they're just coming into the discipline, what do they make of this critique um, rather than just being sort of taught the straight goods and then doing the critique afterwards? Um, yeah, I, I, I think the same problem, and, and different people have different attitudes to exactly. this. I think there are some people who think you need to get that critique out front. You don't want them to be indoctrinated into, you know, some sort of false consciousness or whatever. Um, but but f for me, I, I taught it straight first, and, uh, and then I kind of take it apart later on and let them let them know. And you know what's interesting is they actually know this is going on. Like many of my students. Yep. Um, well, at, before I get to that part in the course, we'll say, but, but I heard that there was something, you know, and they don't know the details, but they know that there's something going on. Good for them. And, um, and being honest about that, once they get to the level that they're asking you questions themselves, oh, absolutely. you know, is the, it, you know, it's like we have this secret cabal <laughs> in my class. <laughs> and, and there's no point in being secret about That's it. That's right. We have. Well, the, and the, here's the thing, and and you and please, please feel, feel free to disagree with me. Uh, I think at the undergraduate level, you know, it, I, maybe two tiers is hard to do, but I, I, you know, and we don't do this at Boise State. I think we ought to be thinking about a track of the stats and research methods for our students who are not going to graduate school. But even in my own research methods class, I still teach SPSS. Yeah. And because that's kind of the gold standard, and that's what we've done forever, I actually think I ought to be teaching Excel. Yeah. I think Excel is going to be much more versatile. We know from APA uh, stuff that only 13% of students are going to go into graduate school in yeah. psychology. Yeah. And Microsoft Excel with pivot tables, every business person I talk to, every national study of employability I read 
tells me that uh, that's much better than, than SPSS or JASP or R, even though those are the sexy things that our colleagues want to want our grad school bound students to, to do. And, and, and I get that, they still need that, but the remaining 56, 57% who we know are going directly in the workforce, I'm not so sure that I'm serving them. Yeah. So. Well, let me disagree with you in two directions at Perfect. the same time. That's awesome. When, when I teach the intro course, I didn't have any computer component at all because it's way too easy to push a button and interpret results okay. than it is to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so making people by hand with a pencil and, and, a, intro hand, stat. and a calculator, you know, calculate T-tests, calculate yeah. ANOVAs mm -hmm. once in their life so they see how you get the numbers out of the data table and into the formulas. So I'm with you on that. When I, when I teach site, uh, it's up, for us it's 295, uh, I, don't use, I don't let them use SPSS. Yeah. They do it by hand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But when I do this intermediate course, and they've all presumably done that somewhere else before, I, um, I teach them in R. Um, R is okay. interestingly problematic. It's a, you know, it's a computer language, and uh, you have to learn how to code. You have to learn how to program. And, and for students who haven't ever done that before, and the vast majority of psychology students, I find, have never done that before, um, there's a learning curve there that, that they find a little difficult. But the reason I use R instead of um, something like SPSS is that R changes all the time. R keeps up. Um, if you read about a new statistic in you know, psych methods, um, there will be an R package which goes up the next week, and you will be able to do that, whereas SPS takes years. I mean, SPS still doesn't have a good power package, and we've been talking about it for 40 years now, right? Yeah. Um, and I use JASP one week um, because I teach in Bayesian methods one week, okay. and JASP uh, has a really good you know, handle on, on comparing the old frequentist methods with the new Bayesian methods, and it's worth looking at. No, no, I, I, think, they're, I think they're adequate tools. I'm just not so sure they're, they're tools that, that serve our students who are not going to graduate no, school. You're right. Well, and, and this yeah. intermediate course is mainly an honors course, so maybe 50 or 60 or 70% oh, of those absolutely. people are applying to graduate school. Yeah. But for, for everyone else, for people who are just trying to get a degree and go on with their lives, right. I think understanding how statistics and probability work is really important. Absolutely. And maybe something like Excel is a, is, is a, is a tool that they will be able to use you know, in, in jobs outside yeah. of academia. That makes perfect sense. I, I think me. it's a yes and. I, yeah. I would think it would be JASP and R and Excel, you know, and Excel yeah. in that mix. I don't think it's an either or. So, yeah. Yeah. so, um, so Chris, for you, uh, given your uh, your your penchant for education, given your your attraction to it, uh, growing up, was it always was it um, was it um, are you going to college or not, or was it always going to be what college are you going to? Um, I was um, raised by a guy, uh, well, by two parents, but my father um, was doing a master's degree part-time uh, when I was really young. He was working, you know, a regular job, and he was, we were in California, I was born and raised in California, and he was uh, working his regular job and then doing a master's degree at San Jose State, you know, on the weekends and the evenings, and then when I was 11, we moved to Stanford campus, and he did a PhD at Stanford, so there's always been a lot of education in the is. family. Um, and my best friend on Stanford campus, this 12, 13-year-old who was, his father was in the computer science department at Stanford. This is in the years way before anyone had ever uttered the phrase Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. um, but he, in those days, of course, computers, computer programs were all encoded on cards. Punch, punch cards. cards. I right? have them. That's right. And uh, he didn't want to punch all those cards for his assignments, <laughs> so he took his son and his son's best friend, me, down to the Stanford Computer Center, and we would punch his cards for him. And when you got your big stack of cards, you would hand it across a counter to some guy who would then run it through the computer, and you'd come back 45 minutes later, and your printout would be there. And he would go, oh, God, it didn't work at all, and we'd have to go, you know, redo a few cards yep. and do it again. And so we would spend our evenings at the Computer Center at Stanford uh, doing his dad's assignments. So higher ed was destined that way. <laughs> Probably. Well, my first, and, and I told Dave Kreiner this story a couple hours ago, my first year of grad school was Carbondale's last year of having punch cards. Oh, really? So I have decks of punch cards at SPSS with JCL, Job Control Language, Great. with the first few cards have that, and then you've got, and if you had one slash in the wrong direction, you were missing a period on one of those cards, it would crash. Yep. You're exactly right. You walked, you walked away, came back 45 minutes later, yep. and you picked up a paper 
paper printout because you didn't get to see it on a screen. No, there were no screens. Yeah, yeah. A, a screen was a huge leap that happened during my time in graduate school. Yeah. So, um, so I, for some reason, I, I guess I just assumed that you've always been a Canadian citizen, but you are not. Are you a Canadian citizen I'm, now? I'm dual citizen now. Dual yeah. citizen now. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, so you, it was always. Uh, Growing up, it was going to be, where are you going to go to school? It wasn't a choice of it. It was pretty much. I, I remember once um, suggesting that I would take a year off after high school, and my parents scowled. Yeah. Um, and, but, I, I, you know, the, uh, we moved to Quebec when I was 14 years old. My dad got a job there after finishing his Ph.D., and um, the school system there is different. Uh, 11th grade, uh, sorry, high school only goes to 11th grade, and then there's just two years of, of college um, a free college that almost everybody goes to. Okay. Um, and I went there, but I was um, I thought I was going to be a musician, and I did two years of music there, got their diploma, their college diploma in music, okay. and then went to uh, McGill University in music, and okay. then left music. All right, so so first, so I don't want to skip over that. So what did you play? Um, trumpet. You played trumpet. And did you play in a band? Uh, well, yeah, a variety of, of different bands, yeah. Okay, yeah. and so did you have your own band that you wouldn't you would call yours? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. I would, no, I didn't have that. I, every now and again, I would try and, like, put together a kind of a band that would, like, play, like, Chicago music or Blood, Sweat, and Tears, you know, those okay. horn bands Cover of the 70s band. and 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, it, it's really, you know, there are books, but they don't actually have charts, and so we weren't really good enough at arranging to, like, okay. write our own charts, and so it never, it never amounted but to But you much. were parts of bands. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. favorite band name from your past? Do you have a favorite band yeah. name? Oh, gee. You know, um, uh, uh, many years later when I was in Vancouver, I was um, associated with a band that was called Martin Fields and the Academy, um, <laughs> which I thought was a hilarious name if you know about the Church of St. Martin and the Fields. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So the mark and T-shirts. I mean, no, you know, yeah, union you, tour. Well, you know, we never got that good. So. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think you could find a, a custom print person, and they'll they'll print you up a, a you know a small batch. I think Martin Fields is still out there, and he he probably has his own T-shirt. There was the front guy had renamed himself oh Martin my gosh. Fields. So do you but. still play at all? Um, I haven't played for years, actually. Although I was on on Amazon just the other day looking for pocket trumpets, I'm thinking about maybe. Oh my gosh! What is a pocket trumpet? A pocket trumpet is a is a full size trumpet, but it's been wrapped in extra time. So the whole thing. Wait, is, wait! Wrapped in extra time? Yeah. Instead of having like instead of having the long uh, uh, tube that runs to the back and then forward all the way to the bell, it's wrapped in extra time. So the whole thing's only about. What, what would be that size? It's smaller than a loaf of bread. Oh, okay. It's got all the tubing, but it's because it's been wrapped in extra time, it's, it's, it's much smaller. It's called oh a pocket my. trumpet. And, oh, my uh, gosh. I thought you were making a joke. No. I no. thought there were, oh, it's got extra time. I, I'd, I'd <laughs> like extra time. What do you mean extra time? Uh, so I, I played French horn. Oh, so yeah. I played from fifth grade through first year of college, and cool. I was never good enough. I don't think... French, a, horn, French horn's a crazy instrument. In yes. a four, in a four in a four person section, I never got better than third chair. So, I I never practiced enough to get good. So, yeah. and never in a band or never part of a serious quartet or anything like that. Yeah. But, but I but I it did give me an ap- appreciation of music for the rest of my life. Which I yeah. so when I hear a classical piece, I can pick out the French horn. Did and, you play like that. quartets and quintets at all? I used to do that. I, I like classical music actually at that age. A and, little bit in high school, yeah. uh, but the, it you know. Um, but again, I was never serious about it. But and thank God there wasn't Facebook for this part. <laughs> but uh, my uh, senior year in high school, I was the drum major. Oh yeah, and I and there are. My mother and father, uh, when they were alive, uh, they had pictures, and so there must be pictures There's somewhere film buried out there somewhere. Isn't yeah, there? but thank God it's not on Facebook. <laughs> you know the polyester, the big hat, you know the yeah, yeah, yeah. baton, you know the whole thing. Yeah. So, so trumpet. All right, yeah. yeah. Uh, occasionally, we'll talk to somebody on the podcast, and they you know, a musical background emerges. So. Yeah. So, um, McG- so McGill is an awesome school. It's an amazing school. I know that much about McGill. And so you do the two-year degree, yeah. um, get your degree in music, and then what happens after that? Well, What's the I, timeline? I went to McGill for a, uh, 
for my first year in music. And I actually um, found the department um, kind of into your business all the time. Um, it, was a, it was a small department. Um, it was very intense. And there were very good people there. I was also surrounded by these incredibly talented people. And it became really evident to me really quickly that um, I was not going to have a wildly successful um, uh, profession, <laughs> if you okay. like, career being a musician. And uh, so uh, this is a true story. I went to the registrar's office. I just wanted to be kind of anonymous in a giant department. And I said to the person at the registrar's office, what is the biggest department in the school? And she said, civil engineering. And I said, I swear to God, this is true. What's the second biggest department in the school? <laughs> and she said, psychology. And I said, sign me up. And that is how I got into psychology. As a grad student? No, no. I was still, this is still as an undergraduate. I, hadn't, I didn't get a, a full bachelor's degree in music. I just did the first year at McGill in music, and then I wanted to get out into some other, into some other department. And uh, so I, Some other department that wouldn't be up in your business. That's right. Oh, my gosh. So you could have been a civil... Well, so what turned you off to civil engineering? Um, I, I, well, I, I, I wasn't much interested in it, and it had a reputation for being extremely hard. In fact, I was thinking poli sci or something, but poly, political science had a reputation for being very difficult too, and I was not actually a very good student in those days. But, but you, you've, you embrace calculus. You, you, you have gone back for more, so you, was, obviously that, you didn't have that attitude then. That's right. Okay. That, that was later. <laughs> because because I, I can't imagine you hearing about something difficult now and going, oh, it's too difficult for me. I'm not going to. What, what, that Give me something lazy. No, lazier. No, I mean, that's. Well, uh, you want the story? So, yes, please. So the story is I, I spend one year in psychology there, and I run out of money, and I drop out of school. Okay. And I, I continue to live in Montreal. My parents are living about a an hour east of Montreal, um, and I spent a year um, playing guitar in the metro station, busking guitar in the metro station, and cutting vegetables in a cafeteria. Um, and then I got fired from the, the cutting vegetables job. And um, it was about that time that I began to realize that I was going to have to make a change, um, or I was wow. going to be living in the same uh, one room apartment that I was living in right then pretty much for the rest of my life. And so I uh, called up my parents and said, bring me home. And of course, my father was a university professor at that time. And so I could just go to his university, this little tiny school called Bishop's University oh, okay. in rural Quebec. And I finished out my psychology degree there. So, so the, the school of hard knocks was the best educator for you. Yeah, I learned quickly, fortunately. Yeah. It was only a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but your your parents didn't have to give you the talk or the lecture. You figured it out on your own. That yeah, that's probably the best way for that to happen, don't you think? Well, you, you when you uh, when you come to that realization yourself, you actually do it. If somebody else tells you, you you know yeah, you push push back. You push against, back, and yeah, that's right. So I I got serious, and I spent the entire summer before my first year at Bishops in the library reading up, and I wore a tie the first day of class, and I announced my seriousness to the world, and. Oh my gosh, you wore a tie the first day. Did you have a briefcase that day too? I, I did not have a briefcase. The briefcase was a little too businessy for me, but I, I thought that, I think it was a, a satin tie. It wasn't a business tie. It was like. It a, was a satin tie. <laughs> does, does, does mom have a picture of that by any wild chance I, I that first day? I don't think so, no. Oh, oh my God. I, all right. Wow, that, 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 that is awesome. So you go to Bishops, you get um, a bachelor's degree in psychology. I did. Uh, Knowing you, I've got to ask, double major, triple minor, what else do you do while um, you're there? My, my father was a drama professor, and I spent a lot of time working in the theater. He so was a I, drama professor. That's right. So, I, yeah, he, we, it was a, we were a performing arts family, which is sort of, so the music thing. In fact, my father was, most people's parents are disappointed when they go into music. Um, my father was disappointed when I left music. Oh, okay. I believe he said something like, a mere social science, when I said I had gone to psychology. Oh, my gosh, that sounds like a line out of Shelton and Big Bang Theory, yeah. you know, knocking the social sciences. That's right. So, um, so I, uh, I didn't really officially do a double major, but I spent most of my time in the theater and did my psychology degree kind of on the side. I, 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 I hope this doesn't offend you, but we have more in common than you think. My, I have a bachelor's degree in psychology and a bachelor's degree in speech communication and theater arts. Oh, really? And my theater arts has served me well all, my entire career. Yeah. 
I mean, I've never been back into the theater. I've never done plays again. But the skill set that you get yep. in handling an audience and teaching large classes has right. served me well for a long well, time. Well, I was mostly a sound and lights guy. Oh. Uh, I was on the tech side, but I did a little bit of acting. And those skills that you learn to speak like this... You know, when you become a professor, you go, oh, my gosh, those skills are actually really useful. To be able to project in a classroom, it, for example. Because a lecture is a performance in Absolutely a way, it right? is. Right? Um, you need to be, I mean, first of all, you need to be clear and people need to understand you. But you need to know how to emphasize, you know, certain points and, you know, downplay other points. And you do all that through your voice. And you learn that by taking acting courses. And the, Okay. And so now the music and the guitar and the trumpet, that's why, that's why you're the sound guy. Is yeah. that because yeah. you are recording stuff I'm yeah. sure, from time yeah. to time? Yeah. All right. Now it's all coming together. All right. So, uh, Bishop, for uh, so what do you do after you have your bachelor's degree? Um, I applied to graduate school. I had a, 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 a professor uh, who taught me social psychology and perception who insisted that I should um, apply to clinical psychology. I didn't really have very much interest in clinical psychology, but he insisted that that was the only way I was going to ever get a job, that there was no jobs in experimental psychology. This was the way I had to go. So I applied to a bunch of clinical psychology programs, and I got in nowhere. Okay. So I went back to Bishop's and hung out in the theater for another year, and... Um, then applied to graduate school a second time, um, half to psychology departments, more experimental departments that I was more interested in, and half to um, 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 Masters of Fine Arts programs in theater. Um, and I was accepted at uh, Simon Fraser in oh, psychology, yeah. which is in Vancouver, and I was accepted in theater at University of Victoria, also in British Columbia. Um, and uh, Simon Fraser had an actual PhD rather than a DFA, and they offered you money for TA ships, whereas the theater program did not. And so again, <laughs> fate swept me towards psychology when I was undecided myself. So did you, did you do anything as an undergraduate? Did you do any of the typical stuff that we advise about students today? Did, were you a research assistant, teaching assistant, internship? Peer advisor, were any of those afforded to you? Did you? No, you know, it's an, it was an extremely small school. There was no graduate program at all. Um, okay. The professors did some research, but not. it wasn't emphasized. It was mainly okay. a teaching school. Um, I had a really good um, honors supervisor who I got along with very well. Okay. And uh, another guy um, who was sort of a mentor to me. Um, right. I managed to get my name on a couple of publications with my supervisor. which As was, an undergraduate? As an undergraduate, which was nice. Wow. Yeah. That, that's incredibly impressive. Well, in those days, it was it was quite unusual. Now, I think it's 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 more common because everything has become so hyper everything that yeah. um, you know you need to have publications as an undergraduate so you can get to graduate school, which is crazy. Um, but uh, in those days, it wasn't that common. I I think it. Well, do you think it's common these days to have publications as an undergraduate? Well, I'll tell you, I um, have taken to basically putting everybody who's in my lab as an author, as a co-author, okay. on almost everything that comes out of my lab, assuming they did some work on it. Oh, of course. Um, yeah, but, yeah. And that includes um, the undergraduate students. Um, okay. It can't hurt. And I know that no, it's happening um, in other labs, and I don't see any reason that my students should be hurt because I have qualms about the um, level of contribution they made as no, undergraduates. No, no, you know, they do, yeah. they do some solid work for me. I ask them to do things. They spend hours doing it. And, uh, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll have eight or ten authors on my publications, and that's just fine. I, I, you know, it's odd for history of psychology. History of psychology tends to be mostly a single author um, business. Um, but because I've been doing this um, digital history of psychology, I've created a laboratory of digital history. Mm -hmm. And we operate now much more like a conventional psychology lab. It's a bunch of people doing collective work. Um, uh, it's really changed the way I do work, and um, it's also increased the number of publications I have by a lot. That's awesome. And working in teams just, you know, does all kinds of things for So are you, are you doing things like visiting archives? Are you, are you doing that kind of thing? I, I, I did for a long time. I, I mean, we're skipping ahead, but I, I kind of retooled at one point as okay. a conventional historian of psychology, and I spent a lot of time reading dead people's mail, as we say, um, which is what you do in archives, and um, writing those kinds of uh, articles. Um, but when this digital humanities thing right. um, sort of began to come into existence mm, less than a decade ago, I right. guess, 
um, I thought, gee, there's no reason you couldn't do that in history of psychology. And of course, I had these old computational skills, you know, collecting dust in the back of my head. And I sort of uh, tooled up again and uh, figured out ways that we could um, do look at huge archives of uh, historical material, things like, you know, uh, complete runs of, of journals over a decade or two or three, um, looking at every article, well, looking at, um, scanning through every sure. article. And we could um, produce a new kind of uh, history of psychology that allows you those big overviews um, of the discipline that had become unfashionable in, uh, histor in history circles in the past 30 or 40 years. Everyone had been doing these micro-histories where you take one particular thing and you investigate it incredibly closely, and that, mm -hmm. that's fun. Um, but um, it's nice to be able to you know, fly over a whole discipline and go, what's the general lay of the land here now? Um, rather than just what is that one person doing or what is that one event or... So kind of a thematic analysis kind of a thing. Well, in a way. Um, well, here, I'll, I'll just tell you what I do. Yeah, so please. what we do is we, yeah. would, we would take like a decade of one of the major journals, like American Journal of Psychology or Psychological Review, which sure. were the big American journals in the 1890s and the 1900s, and <clears throat> we would correlate the vocabulary in every article with every other article pairwise. So every pair of our mm -hmm. articles, and we'd see how much overlap, although we used just a basically a correlation coefficient, how much overlap there was in the vocabularies that we used. And then we convert that giant correlation matrix of however many articles there are by however many articles there are into um, a, a social network. Um, so it gets, it gets laid out visually so that articles that have similar vocabularies are closer together in the network than articles that have different vocabularies. And because this is just the time when the sub-disciplines of psychology are coming into existence and they're just developing their own specialized vocabularies, over time you can see the discipline change as new sub-disciplines you know, emerge and separate themselves out from a, a more general psychology earlier. And so you can, you can actually see then the, the sub-disciplines literally split That's as... Right. That's wow. right. Wow, and so yeah. where are you publishing this? So, so what, um, what journals? Uh, history of Psychology, the APA okay. Journal, um, Journal of the History of Behavioral Sciences, which is the grand old dam of uh, okay. History of Psychology journals. Gotcha. Um, the, the, uh, the, the traditional History of Psychology journals have actually been quite good to me. Okay. Um, as I have gone off on this um, sort of strange eccentric voyage, or or or, or I'm 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 going to reverse it on you. Maybe you've been quite good to them. Well. Um, that would be nice, but um, so I think there are many people doing digital history who have had a lot of trouble with traditional history journals. The mm -hmm. traditional history journals don't like this. Um, they, um, there's, you know, some competition. There's some territoriality. Um, there's a little bit of, you know, um, tension between the old historians and the new historians this way. Um, but I haven't run into that okay. in my little niche. So which uh, journal is, so Division 26, do they have an official journal? Yeah, History what, of Psychology. Uh, that History of Psychology is their official journal. That's right. Okay, gotcha. All right. What do we skip? All right, so, um, so I got accepted at Simon Fraser for a master's degree, and I go there. And um, at this point, because I've been doing drama for so long, I'm sort of interested in the psychology of art, psychology of drama. And I did a big factor analytics study on, I think it had this, it had this incredibly pretentious title. I think it was called The Structure of the Perception and the Evaluation of Art. And I had basically shown people like three paintings and three poems and three pieces of music and had them do one of these semantic differential kind of uh, questionnaires, nice. sort of this Charles Osgoody stuff. Yes. And I had produced a bunch of, you know, factor analytic, you know, um, um, you know, things, uh, mm -hmm. studies uh, of, of their re responses. Um, and it was um, much too long and, 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 and much too pretentious. Um, but uh, as I was beginning to do my PhD, my supervisor became ill and he eventually died. And mm -hmm. so I needed to find a new place to do a PhD. And I ended up at University of Toronto to do the PhD. Um, and by that time, I was beginning to think about cognitive science. Cognitive science was becoming a big issue at that point. Yep. This is like the late 80s. And um, I thought that was a place. Uh, psychology of art was fine, but nobody cared but me. And I, I think I was looking at that point for something that somebody might care about, okay. right, where I felt a little bit more part of the mainstream or the cutting edge in psychology. So you mentioned uh, Charles Osgood and the yep. semantic differential. I actually know that reference, and yep. so I appreciate that. 
Uh, maybe you'll geek out a little bit over this. A couple years ago on my campus, I was collaborating with some of my STEM colleagues. We actually did a Gutman scale. Really? And so I ac we actually did a Gutman scale and did the validity, reliability, and we have a Gutman scale in the literature. So a, really? a, the, a yes, no, self-scoring Gutman scale. There it you was go. a thing of beauty. I mean, I've only been doing this gig for 30 years, but I got <laughs> one of those in the literature. Well, there you go. There you so go. yeah, so it was kind of a geeky survey design moment. So right. I thought you would appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I love the model of you're working with students and you're getting them published, but you're, I, you know, I, I, I like that model of making the history of psychology relevant uh, for, for students today. You're doing it in the classes, but you're also doing it in the lab as well. You yeah. really found a way. Uh, I, don't, I don't even want to call it a niche. I was going to call it a niche, but I don't think it is for you. I mean, yeah. it's just... Uh, way of life, where it's just your uh, bread and butter, so to speak. Well, I think when I switched from doing traditional history to doing digital history, it was just a natural way to go, that um, digital history requires a lot of people doing a lot of things. It's, it's, there's a lot of uh, um, kind of scut work that needs to be done. There's a lot of, you know, downloading articles and, you know, writing computer programs and, uh, you know, just stuff that needs to be done and no one person can do it and having a team of people um, makes it possible. Do you think there's any interest anymore? Uh, I'm asking this question for a friend, by the way. <laughs> uh, is, is there any interest anymore in the biography in, in the history of psychology or is that kind of a dead art? Um, I think that historians, uh, like um, academic historians, um, look down upon the biography have for and have for maybe 40 years. Um, they uh, don't appreciate that approach to history anymore. Um, I think it was seen as being part of that old great man tradition. Yeah. Um, and when social history sort of came in in the, in the 70s and the 80s, um, we were supposed to look at you know social organizations and, and groupings, um, social events, not at one individual and sort of glorify and celebrate that single individual. I think you can write biographies in a way that don't actually partake of that old tradition, um, but you have to make, uh, you have to plead a very special case with historians um, to be able to do biography that way. So, so in your career, where did you pick up the history expertise? Because you clearly have it. Uh -huh. Is that part of the philosophy? I mean, yeah, philosophers where, aren't... where's the PhD in history? Where's, yeah. where's that from? Um, I, I don't have a PhD in history. In fact, I am Yet. not my, 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 my here, uh, my history department at my university will not allow me to cross a point to their department because I do not have a PhD in history of psychology. You or, even, sorry, in history. You can't even cross-list classes? No. Or? Um, well, I can, but it wouldn't. I mean, they, they, they're, they're free to take my courses if they wanted to, and occasionally they have, but I don't think it counts toward their degree because it's not a real history course. Oh, my gosh. And, and really? I just picked up my history. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, you sure. know, you just you read and you read and you read. Yeah, it's a little bit more than that, but okay, we'll leave it there if that's what you want to. But, you know, you're being modest now. It's not more than read and read and read. A lot of people read history, but they don't start publishing in it. They don't become one of the leaders in the discipline of the history of psychology by just reading and reading and reading. Well, no, then you have to write and write and write. But. Right, and contribute. Have you been... Um, have you been active in leadership in Division 26? I was the president of Division 26. Of course you were. I should have known that. Ten years ago or something yeah, like exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. Of course you were. Um, but so. I'm not in the APA anymore, so. Okay. But you can, as a, you, you can be a member of Division 26, but not an APA. There's some sort of affiliate yeah, yeah. status, and I haven't quite figured out how yeah. it works. Well, you can be a member of Division 2, Society for Teaching of Psychology, but yeah. not be a member of APA. Yeah. So they might have the same deal. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, so if you're not a member of APA, member, are you a member of CPA? I'm not a member of CPA anymore either. I've, I've, um, I mean, for a variety of reasons, I have... Um, it's none of my business? No, no, it's, it, I'm, I, it's not a problem. I'm just trying to figure out how I talk about it. Um, um, uh, CPA has a history and philosophy section, history and philosophy of psychology section, um, but it, it's very small. And, I, and uh, when I have Canadian topics... I will often rejoin for a year and go to the conference and present oh, on my Canadian okay. topic because nobody down here 
will care about those topics. Um, uh, and that happens every four or five years. I get Canadian topics from time to time. Um, and uh, But there is a, a, a fantastic little history of social and behavioral sciences group, um, which is international. There's Canadians and Americans and uh, Brazilians and some Europeans called Chiron. Oh, yeah. The International sure. Society for Behavioral and Hist- uh, Social Sciences. Yeah. Or the History of Behavioral and Social Sciences. And I go to that very regularly. And it's a... It's a small group. It's maybe 350 and um, 80 or 90 or maybe 100 will turn up to a conference every year. And it's a terrific place. And that's where I do most of my conferencing. I've heard of that that group. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Chris, what have we not covered? I've almost kept you an hour, and that was the deal. Okay. And I, I... you know, okay, so Facebook. So, so you get to know people through Facebook, and you're, you've become more active on Twitter lately yeah. as well. Yeah. So, so you're you're a welcome voice on Twitter. So, what is it with you and sports? <laughs> Academic males are not allowed to talk about their sports interests. You see. Well, I, I have sports interests too, but not as many as you do. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a Chicago Bears fan. I'm a lifelong Bears fan. And, you know, and I do follow college sports a little bit just because Boise State Broncos. Yeah, yeah. Um, but is I, that the place with the blue field? Yes, it's it the is. the blue field, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, it is. And we are very proud of that blue field. <laughs> Uh, because before 1986, no one knew about Boise State uh, nope. uh, in the country, in, the nor- in North America. And then a guy named Gene Blameyer has the brilliant idea of having that Boise State blue. And that has been, uh, our former president called it the, uh, the window to the university. Really? And he was right, because people started looking at us. And after we won, uh, and I'm going to say we, like I was there, uh, the I'm Fiesta sure Bowl yes. in 2007, you well, know, as, right. as part of the team, you know, of course. I think that's about the time I became aware of them because they were suddenly on TV. They'd never been on TV Well, they before. beat Alabama 43-42 in double right. overtime in the Fiesta Bowl. Not that I know the score or anything. <laughs> uh, the following, the, that January semester, uh, the average GPA of our undergraduate admits goes up. The average GPA of our graduate admits goes up. Really? So, you know, uh, you can say all you want about, you know, the academics sometimes distract from the university. Uh, the, co- the football team uh, self-funds. Yeah. And they help fund other uh, non-revenue sports. And we saw our, uh, our academic excellence go up oh, in terms of that. Yeah. So, but anyway, you're, you're a sports fan as I'm, well. I'm mainly a baseball guy. I'm mainly a baseball guy. Okay. And, um, and I... Again, just accidentally happened upon this guy when I was doing my history of psychology research. It was a guy who had made a call for a special history of psychology textbook that only focused on experimental psychology. And this isn't like in 1926. So it's a couple of years before Edwin Boring writes the classic history of experimental psychology textbook. Yeah. And I want, who's this guy? He'd fallen out of the history of the discipline as far as I knew. His name was Coleman Griffith. He was at Illinois. Okay. So I start following up this guy. It turns out this guy's the first guy who set up a sports psychology laboratory, a purpose-built sports psychology laboratory in an American university. Okay, yes. And I go, well, that's interesting. I don't know anything about sports psychology, and I don't care much about sports psychology, but it's interesting. And then it turns out he works, he's called in to work with the Chicago Cubs in the late 30s by P.K. Wrigley, who owns the team at the time, to be the first sports psychologist in America who works a professional team. So here I am back in baseball, and I've got this history of psychology thing going on at the same time. So I started writing some some stuff about, about Coleman Griffith. Now, the males who male academics who are interested in sports all know each other. They all tip each other off at conferences, but they do not speak publicly of this. And I knew that there were about 10 or 12 guys in Division 26 in the History of Psychology Division of APA um, who had back burner sports t- projects that they hadn't actually brought to fruition. And so Ludy Benjamin and I got on the horn with all of them and said, it is time we're going to write a book on the history of sports psychology. You did write a book, and it just came out in the past year, didn't it? Well, no, that uh, it came out, I think it's earlier than that. It's 2000, 
2009 or something. I, I, I do have a book that just came out, but that's not the sports psychology book. There's this earlier book called uh, Psychology Gets in the Game, and that was all my buddies um, finally doing their sports psychology uh, okay. Uh, project. But, but, okay, but we'll circle back to that. But okay. you just have you had a book about the psychology in cities, right? That's right. right. I have a brand-new book called the, uh, Psychology and Its Cities. Okay, so let's come back to that. But okay. I want you to finish the sports th- thread. And it, well, so it, you know, it turned out that the two of them, sort of the the history of psychology and the interest in sports, kind of collided, and it gave me this opportunity to sort of draw everybody together into this book on sort of the prehistory of sports psychology. There's a football article, and there's a I think a golf article or a chapter rather, and I did a, another thing on Coleman Griffith, and uh, Ludy Benjamin did th- something on football, I think, and anyway, we had a we had a fun time doing that book. And so, so now when you travel, you try to catch a baseball game in season. Is that? Uh, well, yes. everywhere? Not at, well, not not everywhere, but sometimes I do. Actually, I, I've taken to doing these uh, summer trips, um, minor, minor league baseball tours. Um, last uh, summer was the first one, sort of in central New York, and I've got another one planned for this summer in uh, Pennsylvania. I've got an Ohio one laid out, uh, maybe for the year after that. I, I drag a couple of friends along, and we go to. Uh, you know, Triple A ball is pretty much, you know, in many ways like Major League ball. But as you work your way down the ranks of minor leagues, um, the parks get yeah. smaller and the players get more desperate. It's, and it's the single A ball. Those are those are those are folks who want to play for the love of the game. They do. They're uh, they're, they're it's a lot of fun. It's yeah. a lot of fun. And you get to see all these different places that you'd never go to otherwise. And... All right, and so that and that's the. Uh, and so you have found kindred spirits to go to these games with? Yeah. Yeah, I got a couple of buddies. A couple of grad school buddies, actually, who uh, will uh, go on these tours with yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and plus, you know, they, they, they normally have, some of them have wacky names. You the know, teams, the, yes, they the, do. The minor league teams. Yes. And, you know, and so, uh, and then, I, you know, ballpark food. It's hard to beat ballpark food. Yeah. I mean, a lot of Yeah, well, at triple-A ballpark food is pretty good. At single-A ballpark food is pretty rudimentary. Pretty bad. So okay. You may want to have dinner before you go to the game. Okay, very good. <laughs> so so let's, cl- let's close out with your book about psychology and cities. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, when people write about the history of psychology, uh, well, traditionally it tends to be the sort of march of theories without any reference to anything else in the universe, um, except for when you get to eugenics and people will talk a little bit about um, uh, what happened um, around that, what was happening in the in the society around those things. But, um, of course, psychology mostly develops at universities in major cities um, in New York and in Boston and in Baltimore and in Chicago. And um, I had never seen anybody talk about what's going on in American cities at that time. It's an incredibly um, uh, violent, um, exciting, uh, revolutionary time in the development of American cities. Um, There's uh, racial strife and there's labor unrest and mm-hmm. there are riots and uh, there's this you know massive immigration. People complain about immigration now. The, the wave of immigration that came in in the 1880s and 1890s was unlike anything um, that uh, the U.S. had seen before. Um, all of these problems inform the ways in which um, psychology developed. The, the cities were busy trying to put together a universal public education system for the first time ever and the kids spoke 15 different languages. Right. Um, so not only did they have this massive um, project that they were trying to implement, but they had to do, they had to accommodate all these different religions and languages and, and, and ethnic backgrounds. Um, and when you look at psychology through that lens, the development of psychology through that lens, it begins to look a little different. Um, there's a reason there's so much educational psychology early on, because that's where psychologists got their outside contracts. It's where they got their jobs outside beyond the university. And it was where they proved to their uh, administrators and to the politicos who, you know, sort of you know, you know, ran the place um, that there was a practical use um, um, for psychology. And that was very important because all those land-grant schools that come into being in the 1860s and 70s mm-hmm. and 80s and 90s, um, part of that charter is that you have to um, it's to advance practical knowledge, which generally means either it's a teaching school or it's an engineering or an agricultural school, which is why we have all these schools called A&T and A&M. 
that's a legacy of, of, of the practical knowledge that right. you were supposed to do in, in, in the land-grant schools. Psychologists, if they were going to set up departments of there, can persuade people that they should get a professorship in office space and lab space and all this stuff. They had to present a practical aspect to their work, and education was often the practical aspects. We will be able to help this you know, uh, advance this you know, giant project of putting together a universal public school system. So. Yeah, so th- I mean, and I don't, to my knowledge, no one's ever really thought about it that way, or at least they've not thought about it and published about it that way. They don't talk about it in history of psychology much. You know, in history of education, there's been um, some work on that, obviously. Okay. Um, um, but there are all these different issues. They're all interlinked, but there are all these different issues. Um, and even psychologists who were not, um, what's the word, who were not terribly um, sympathetic to the problems, James McKean Cattell despised cities, built a castle on a mountain 40 miles north of New York City because he refused to live in New York City. <laughs> but he develops mental tests, and right. whatever he thinks mental tests were for, the school system knew what to do with mental tests immediately right. um, and how they were going to help them you know, sort kids out and set up you know, streams and, and this kind of stuff. Um, so they all contributed to these problems that were created by the massive growth of the cities at the turn of the 20th century. So that's what the book's about. There is no shortage of things for us to study, is there? No. No. Right. And you got your next project ready to go? Um, well, you know... You don't I'm, have to disclose it. Well, I'm working on the replication crisis. I've taken my digital history work and kind of moved it forward, and we're looking at... We're busy extracting statistical reports from um, uh, a dozen journals over a 70-year period to see how far back into the past wow. these problems actually um, continue. Is this a recent phenomenon, the statistical problems that have led to the replication crisis, or has this been part of psychology's All use of statistics back to the 1940s? Wow. And, you know, the funny thing, no, actually not the funny, the interesting thing about that is that no matter what the answer is, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. So either this has been us all along, and we just got around to noticing it, yeah. or this is a recent phenomenon, and it's good for us to know that too. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for taking the oh, time. I had a great time. You, you have, oh, we're going to get you out just in time for a game that you need to watch. So That's I, right. I, I, I want to make sure to honor that. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was I, my pleasure. Mm-hmm.